Hello, I'm Linda Burris, and like you, I'm wild about Washington. Fish and Wildlife Enforcement Officers took on a different role during the recent flooding in western Washington. Because of their extensive training in all aspects of public safety, they were able to offer valuable assistance to people whose lives faced some real challenges. So whenever we have a natural disaster within our communities that we work or reside in, we're going to be out there to assist local law enforcement, fire and rescue, to assist those people and whatever, whatever needs they need us, whether it's by boat, aircraft, foot, vehicle, patrol, we'll get out there and do it. During the recent flooding, uh, the local law enforcement agencies and search and rescue asked Fish and Wildlife Enforcement to utilize a lot of their vessels and knowledge of the local lo uh, knowledge of the uh, geography. The officers in Lewis County and Mason County basically just jumped in and assisted in whatever way possible. Also by bringing our boats, uh, our knowledge of the area, we were able to get into areas that a lot of people couldn't. For example, at, uh, in North Mason County, I was assigned to bring a boat uh, to assist uh, the Tahuya Peninsula where it uh, was basically slided in. Every bridge, every road was supposedly washed out. Uh, Coast Guard was sending in their helicopters. Uh, when I reported in to the Emergency Command Center, I quickly found out that nobody had checked the roads. So I went up and by some back roads I was able to get into this area. And later on that evening I was able to bring a team of search and rescue, uh, swift water rescue into that area. So there was about 20 people uh, seeking shelter at the uh, uh, small fire department up in Collins Lake. And we were able to make sure we could get up there to them and bring whatever needs they needed, food or water. What I'm hearing back from the other officers and sergeants that work the area, they were vital in providing uh, their expertise in uh, river navigations on their boats and four-wheel drive expertise in what we do uh, in getting to some of these people that couldn't be gotten to. So, and just to check their status, down in Lewis County, I've heard that uh, uh, they were able to get a couple of people out of the houses where the waters were rising and uh, basically just provide assistance to these folks. A lot of people don't know that we're out there just not only to enforce the fish and wildlife laws, but to public safety, public service. That's what, that's what we do. And in these small communities, we become part of the fold where they don't recognize what patch we're wearing. We're just there to help. And I had more than one person just thank us for being up there. With the new year, there will be salmon fishing opportunities in Puget Sound, thanks in part to a practice called selective fisheries. And salmon and steelhead stocks in the Northwest have been listed as threatened or endangered under the Federal Endangered Species Act. Providing opportunities for recreational, commercial, and tribal harvest of healthy stocks, and specifically hatchery stocks, has been very challenging for fish managers. One of the tools that we have to try to provide access to good, healthy stocks of hatchery fish, hatchery salmon, is what we call selective fisheries. Selective fisheries have been around for about 10 years now, starting with coho salmon off the coast and in the Strait of Juan de Fuca. But uh, recently we've been gaining more momentum to provide additional selective fisheries and additional opportunity for recreational anglers, especially in the Puget Sound area. So some upcoming opportunities this winter for selective Chinook fishing include the San Juan Island area, Area 7, uh, from Port Townsend down to Edmonds, we call that Area 9, and the Bremerton, Seattle area, which we call Area 10. These selective Chinook opportunities will allow anglers to keep two fish that are marked hatchery fish instead of the one that we had previously. So one of the great opportunities we had last summer was a selective Chinook fishery in the summertime in marine areas 9 and 10. Those areas run from Port Towns into Edmonds and then down to the northern end of Ashon Island. This was the first Chinook salmon summer fishing opportunity we'd had since 1994. That fishery generated nearly $4 million of economic activity, which goes directly to the businesses that rely on fishing and tourism for their livelihoods here in the Seattle Tacoma area. We use the term selective fisheries to describe salmon fisheries where 
The angler is required to release unclipped, what we call wild fish, but they are able to retain clipped hatchery fish. The state has invested a significant amount of money into marking our hatchery products, our hatchery salmon, by clipping these fins off of them and allows the anglers to readily identify that those are hatchery fish as opposed to the wild fish. The benefit of this is that we get a good economic return on our hatchery products that we're paying for as anglers and as taxpayers of the state, which is generating this economic activity for folks. And secondly, it helps reduce the amount of these fish that are coming back to the hatchery that are surplus and really can't be used for any other benefit. We put them out there for folks to catch and we want to try to provide opportunities for people to catch them. And Selective Fisheries allows us to access those hatchery fish while at the same time minimizing our impacts on these wild stocks that are depressed. Continued and hopefully increased selective fishing opportunities in the future will help keep Washington as the salmon capital of the world. Here are other fishing opportunities in the coming weeks. Fish and Wildlife recently received equipment donations from the Mule Deer Federation. This donation will go a long way in helping with the enforcement of the state's wildlife conservation laws. We received a Mule Deer decoy and three video cameras. Uh, those items uh, our program can't normally afford, we, we just, they're not in our budget. And working with the Mule Deer Foundation, they were uh, just great folks. Uh, they were open to what we needed uh, to do our job better and what could we use to help us apprehend people that were out there violating fish and wildlife laws and to help the natural resource. This equipment will really help us a lot. We have, uh, we'll be able to use the video cameras uh, while we're uh, serving search warrants to apprehend uh, folks that have violated the Fish and Wildlife Code. Uh, we'll also use it on our uh, deer decoy operations. Uh, also use it to uh, video evidence and many other uh, items and, and uses out there that it, it just really help help our program a lot. Normally we set the deer decoys out in areas where we have complaints of poaching, where we've had uh, several complaints of spotlighting. That's where we normally set these, these decoys up. This one happens to be a two-point mule deer, uh, which in most areas is illegal to shoot. It has, uh, mule deer has to be a three-point or better, and in areas where we've had two-point mule deer shot and left, we've had a lot of problems. We'll set this decoy out and, uh, and hopefully apprehend folks that are, most folks are good, good about abiding by the law, but there are a few out there that uh, they see something and they're just going to shoot it. Winter wildlife viewing? Here are a few suggestions.
Parks has developed a series of print icons depicting the diverse character of our 120 state parks. Here's a sample of the artwork and what you can expect at these locations. This has been Wild About Washington, brought to you by the employees of the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Working together, we can keep Washington's outdoor heritage for future generations. Thank you for watching.